But in the meantime, now this is like the greatest thing. So I'm at a bar after I proposed to her and she's accepted and we're going to get married the next week. And uh, this girl comes up to me and she's like, I can't believe you're getting married tomorrow night. You know, well, it's just a Friday night because we're getting married. And she says, I can't believe you're getting married tomorrow night. I said, well, you know, I just, you know, I am. I, you know, I love her. You know, she's playing the storyline. She's like, well, I, I, I have to sleep with you. She goes, if you're getting married, and she actually slept with me because she thought I was going to get married the next day. She wanted to sleep with me before I got married. And, uh, I don't think I ever saw her again. But I thought, how great is this? I'm getting laid strictly because the girl thinks I'm going to get married and wants to sleep with me before I get married. So the next day, of course, you know, I'm going to dump her at the altar. So, of course, they've, uh, everybody's all at the ring, and they have Luke Brown, who's one of the referees, who was uh, him and Grizzly Smith were the Kentuckians. They were big, uh, I guess they were pretty big drawn heels. Or maybe, I'm sorry. Baby faces as these big fat fucking uh, hillbilly fucks, you know what I mean? Big fat baby faces, you know, they got over like the Haystacks, Calhoun and shit. And, uh, but now he's a thin guy, tall, thin guy, you know, and he's driving some ring and he referee, but he's like 6'10, so it was always kind of, when he did rep, it was kind of bizarre because, like, the referee just, you know, dwarfed everybody, you know. And uh, so they got a preacher's hat on him, so he's like 7 to 5, you know, with a big stove that looks like Abe Lincoln. And he's in the ring, and, uh, so, of course, I, you know, so they play her music, she goes down, they play my music, I don't come down, I cut a promo on her. And, I, and it was great, because I was like, I was the heavyweight champion at the time. I had a Santa Claus hat on, you just you know, rub it in, it's the holidays, she's getting dissed. My cool oak leaves, because they were cool at the time. And, uh, and I'm like, you fat whore, I wouldn't marry you if you're the last girl on earth. Uh, I had a plane ticket, I cashed them back in, the flowers, I picked out of Mr. McDougal's yard. The candy was, was rotten. And then Veronica's all happy, yeah, I knew he'd never dump you me for you, yeah, you fat cow. So then um, then everybody on the show wants to beat me up now, so they all started to beat me up. Finally, and me and Steve Dahl have been feuding for a year now. Now here's the culmination before we go into the next big, you know, our next round of the program. And uh, finally he gets a hold of me, beats me all over the place, and finally I stop him, put him up on the second rope, and uh, I power dropped him off the, like he was sitting on the top of I was standing on the second rope. And fucking, and back then, that's fucking 1988, uh, 1989 maybe. You know, nobody did shit like that. Yeah, yeah nobody did shit like that. Fucking Paul Jordan. I mean, nobody really does that now just because, you know, it's a little risky. Fucking Paul Jordan went off the thing. He fucking went out, went to the fucking, did the crop. He saw, like, you know, like a fish. Fucking, uh, they put him on a stretcher, fucking carted him off. And uh, we both got promos and went home for the holidays. And the rematch is going to be Christmas Day. I mean, the biggest day of the year. Somehow it was still going to be an event, though. Hmm. Rather odd that we were still second from the top, and that kind of curious. But nevertheless, and then we had our big fucking uh, thing, and then so now the program's really getting high. We're gonna have the mixed tags. First night of mixed tags, the two girls start shooting on each other. Me and Steve Dollar laughing, you know, on the, on the floor, and the girls are banging each other's head in the mat, and they kicked us out of our own angle. <laughs> A year in the making, they kicked us out and put the Beetlejuice on, and Alma drilled it, which made no sense whatsoever. But that's poor the rest. There you go. And then, uh, all right, GWF, what, what's your memories of there? How'd you end up there? Right. What, what do you think of it? Do you think ESPN would make it big? Um, all right, let's see. So now, oh, yeah, so Portland, so this is how I got, they got rid of me. It was um, two years I'd been there, and I really felt like Lenny was keeping the territory down. Like, I really thought, like, we could have done a lot better business, and I know we could have, because, and, and I finally figured out what Lenny was doing. Like, he would, um, what he would do is he'd keep it at a certain level that he knew he could always keep. And then when Don Owens, was, the promoter, would say, hey, you know, hey, Jesus Christ, business is down. He's like an 85-year-old guy. Hey. Lenny, would, Lenny would bring Lord the Barbarian or shoot a good angle. Place would go up, kind of slowly filter back down, and go back to where it was. And it was smart on Lenny's behalf because what it did was it gave him longevity because if he, if he always threw hot stuff on, he'd have to follow it. Yeah. But by keeping it medium, he'd never have to follow anything. Which I thought was bullshit because I thought, fuck, I know I can come up with creative shit. I know we can. Let's keep this fucker hot. I didn't make a play for the book, but that's what it came across as. You know what I mean? I just got fucking hot about that. Fucking, because it was taking money out of my pocket, you know? But in his mind, it was taking money out of his pocket long term. And so he engineered them letting me go. You know, even though I was the top fucking uh, guy on the show, they fucking engineered my way out and uh, gave my two week notice at Christmas time, which was a recurring theme because in Florida, I got let go at Christmas time too. I got let go at Christmas time with the WWE. Yeah, I was get let go at Christmas time. Um, I don't know why. Probably because I'm Jewish. Damn. Um, so they let me go, and I was fucking distraught. I mean, like, what the fuck am I going to go? And I'd already been offered four months, maybe four months into being in Portland, WCW called 
And he said, well, I'd like to give you 100 grand a year. And Jim Ross called. He said, Jim Ross wants to get hold of you. So I fucking, so I went to Lenny's house. And me and Lenny were close back then. Obviously, we drifted apart, you know, as time went on. But we were really close. And uh, he goes, uh, and, and I always looked for like a, my father was never there for me. So I always looked for a father figure type person. And I, you know, you end up getting burned by it a lot of times. But nevertheless, you know, I always looked for that big brother or something to fill a gap that I was missing. And uh, so Jim Ross, so they said, oh, Jim Ross. I said, oh, my God, Jim Ross. So I talked to Jim Ross, called from Lenny's house. I'm nervous as fuck. I've been working a year and a couple months at this point. Yeah. And he's like, we want you to come in. We want you to be a, a heel commentator. And you'll wrestle on the show. I mean, it's fucking my lifelong dream. But in my mind, and, and this, uh, you know, whatever. In my mind, I'm thinking, I'm not ready for this. Fuck. I've been working a year and three months. They're going to give me... Let me co-host Saturday night with Jim Ross, or maybe it wasn't Saturday night. Maybe that was maybe it was Sunday or something. It was co-host one of the shows. Uh -huh. Maybe. And, and, and it was, was Cornette doing Saturday? If Cornette was doing Saturday night. It wouldn't have been. But if, it, if he wasn't, it would have been. And um, and Russell, you know, I said, "Fuck is, you know, I'm not sure, man. I'm not sure." So uh, I said, "Yeah, you know, I'm really interested. You know, I'll call you back." And then, so then I talked to Lenny and I told him I wasn't ready. And Lenny's like, "Look," he goes, "I know you're really nervous about this." And I added Russell later on, "Hey, fuck me." Um, he goes, I'll talk to Jim Ross every couple of weeks until you decide what you want to do. So I should have just done business myself. But I didn't. I don't think Lenny ever fucking called him again, you know. And uh, finally, by after like a month, I go, you know what? I want to do this. I told Lenny to call him. He called him. He, said, he probably never even called him then either. And fucking, he goes, they're not interested now, you know. And it taught me a couple of things about the business. Uh, a, you're going to get fucked. Um, B, do your own business. You got to do your own business because you can't let anybody else, you know, even people you trust, I really trusted him at the time. He really fucked me bad. I'm glad I didn't find out he fucked me at the time because it really would have crushed me, you know what I mean? Like I didn't figure it out or for a year or two, or a couple of years maybe, or maybe a year, whatever. And, um, but I also learned that timing is everything because I thought in my mind, I thought, man, if they want me this bad now, I want to work a year and three months, fuck, in six months, they're going to want me even more. But that's not how the business works. When there's a spot, it's open. It's only open for a short window because they'll find somebody else to fill it and it may not be open again for a while or ever. You know, so, but what that did was that really fucked me over. By not calling JR back, I got a really bad reputation as, as, as you know, as a prima donna. You know, which I was anything but. Um, you know, I was a fucking bumping chicken shit heel was, would humiliate himself until the last thing I was a prima donna. And, uh, so now I want to get into WCW and I leave Portland, but they're not fucking interested. I think that's when I figured out that I wouldn't fuck me, because they wouldn't even take my fucking calls. And, uh, but I knew all the work. I knew that I was going to have to get into WCW, because WWF was all big guys back then. It was a big guy territory, and there was no way I was big enough to fit in. So I knew I was going to have to get into WCW, and they were based out of Atlanta, and there was a lot of indies. The red light's beeping. Yeah, four minutes. All right. And the, um... And all the Indies were in Atlanta. Like now, like now the smart area to live in is the Philly area because that's the hub of the Indies. But back then, Atlanta was the hub. And uh, so I figured I moved to Atlanta, so I packed all my shit in a U-Haul, drove to fucking... Uh, in first place, the first thing I did was I drove to Atlanta and I drove straight to Main Event Gym, hoping I'd run into a wrestler I might have met somewhere, get a connection, you know, because Lex and Sting owned it. And, uh, and I actually ran into a buddy of mine, Hugo Gardine, from who I went to rival high schools with, and we used to fuck each other's girlfriends. And so, I got a big rivalry like high school and after, after high school because I fucked his, I was fucking his ex and then, and then his current girlfriend, I fucked her first, like, before he did. So there was, you know, there was always a big heat and he was like a kickboxer fucking kid and whatever. But anyway, but now, you know, a couple years have passed and now we're cool. And uh, hooked up with him, found a place to stay, kind of settled my way into Atlanta. And then, um, and then my, the next phase of my career in life began, but you want to change state? Oh yeah. What's your memories? Wasn't all out there. I mean, I went to Atlanta, hub of Indies and stuff. Got a, did a bunch of Indies for Petticino and stuff. And um, he was real hard on me. Hired me. Hired me for Global. I was one of the only three guys to get a contract. Me and uh, the Patriot and company and Chris Walker. And then eventually the X-Pac got a contract too. But that was it. And uh, it's three hundred bucks. Three hundred bucks a show plus three hundred bucks a week.